Welcome back, or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're looking at the prospect of what a President Trump would sound like or what he would do. Uh, Sarah Hagmeyer, spokesperson for Students for Trump, joins us from Tabernacle, New Jersey. Welcome back. Welcome back as well to former spokesperson for the Republican National Committee and a former spokesperson, uh, former senior advisor to Mitt Romney, Kevin Sheridan, who is in Washington, D.C., here in the studio with Celia Bellin, uh, who's a research fellow at the, the University of Paris at Assas. And uh, joining us from Los Angeles, John Thomas, a GOP strategist, uh, who supports Donald Trump. Thanks for joining our, our conversation. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, j just before the break, uh, uh, Celia Bellin talking about how uh, the world was looking at, uh, at this uh, with mouths a bit agape, wondering what a Donald Trump will do, particularly on the world stage at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. It's something that Barack Obama picked up on. All right, we'll hear from Barack Obama later. Um, the, 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 the jokes uh, are coming when it comes to uh, how, a, how a Donald Trump uh, would act uh, on the world stage. Uh, let me ask you a question. Sarah Hagmeyer, uh, when's the first time you heard of Donald Trump? Oh, I've never, I have known Donald Trump since I was little. I mean, not as a political figure, um, we've known him since about, you know, a, an iconic businessman. Um, but now, now things have changed and we're viewing him a little differently. But did you first know him as a businessman or did you know him because he hosted that show, uh, The Apprentice, on NBC? <laughs> I actually have never watched The Apprentice, um, surprisingly. Um, I've only known him for his success. Um, I have his books. I have... I have the art of the deal, um, but that's that's the only Donald I really know. I haven't really looked into his more the entertainment side, um, but I mean. All right, uh, Sarah's saying she hasn't looked much into the entertainment side. Uh, Kevin Sheridan, how much did uh, being a reality TV star give Trump a jump on the competition? Well, he rewrote all the rules. Uh, he dominated every news cycle. He would, uh, you know, he would uh, brand every single one of his opponents in very, very damaging uh, brandings, lying Ted Cruz and low energy Jeb Bush. And uh, he, he uh, this is stuff that he learned from both entertainment and from business over the last 30, 40 years. And we've never seen anything like it. And the media, because they made so much money off of him, he got ratings. Uh, they played right into it in a lot of ways. They, they love to have him on. I mean, I can't tell you how many you know, times I've been just called up to talk about Trump in the last year. Everybody wants to talk about him, and every time he's on, he gets ratings. So, you know, he's completely rewritten the rules. Uh, John Thomas, uh, free publicity, a big part of it. What I, I read some surveys talk in figures like $2 billion worth of free advertising, they say, because he's gotten so much more coverage than his rivals. Yeah, he certainly benefited from a ton of earned media coverage. Uh, it's a skill to be able to dominate a news cycle like Donald Trump has day in and day out. Usually a campaign is lucky to, to win one or two news cycles in the home stretch before an important primary state. Donald Trump's done it time and time again. But let's not forget, Donald Trump's done a lot more than just win news coverage. He is, he's positioned himself and he understood from the outset that it's important to be an outsider that the electorate, both on the Republican side and the Democratic side, is fed up with the establishment. And so what did Donald Trump do? He said, I'm not taking contributions, I'm self-funding. And that was really a key move that he made from the outset. And he's not politically correct, and that turns off some people, but it also brings in a whole net of voters that are fed up with business as usual and politicians as usual out of D.C. Celia Benav, there's a presidential election in this country next year. Right. Uh, one candidate has played the outsider card, not the same politics, mm -hmm. uh, Marine Le Pen from the far right uh, uh, National Front. But tell me, will all of the candidates be uh, drawing lessons from Donald Trump's uh, improbable uh, rise uh, within the Republican Party? 
Right. I don't think any of them would really go along the uh, anti anti intellectualism that um, and vulgarity that uh, Donald Trump seems to love. Uh, there is still uh, some sort of um, maybe a, a snobbishness or at least an um, an intellectual purity in the French electorate, which asks from its leaders uh, to be talking about uh, complicated uh, uh, policy positions uh, in a way that really Donald none Trump of them will, will, will adapt more this sort of shoot from the hip say something and then if it doesn't work say something different a little bit later on right that would that would mean that uh, the important thing is dominate the news media uh, in the only a personality like Donald Trump which is so used to being on TV and to being disparaged and to accept basically is extremely comfortable with himself the fact of being 11 years on TV and having his life you know he has six biographies written about himself he has scandals all over he has so many uh, uh, ridiculous elements about his own personal life exposed to the world that now he's extremely comfortable with himself and so he doesn't care and I'm not sure how thick the skins of our politicians are but they it's, it's extremely different. Also, we have uh, still a tendency to protect private life a, a bit more uh, in this country. I still think that um, people would draw, draw conclusions mostly on um, what he represents politically, on the fact of listening to the people, of the fact of listening to the voice of the disenfranchised, of the Americans that feel unrepresented, not represented by the main party. There you have real lessons drawn from Trump. All right. What uh, Donald Trump represents on the world stage still has people guessing, as hinted to by Barack Obama at that White House Correspondents' Dinner. They say Donald lacks the foreign policy experience to be president. But in fairness, he has spent years meeting with leaders from around the world. Miss Sweden. <laughs> Miss Argentina. <laughs> Miss Azerbaijan. John Thomas, uh, we saw Donald Trump do something unusual last week, read from a prompter, and it was for a foreign policy uh, speech. Will he be as much of an isolationist as uh, Celia was describing in part one of our conversation? First of all, let me address the joke that the president made. It was a funny joke, but I will remind your viewers that back in 2008, Barack Obama was a freshman senator, not not exactly having a lot of foreign policy experience either. So it sounds like he ruled himself out from being president in the first place. So that's not a fair shot. Uh, but but the other question is, look, what is he going to be like on foreign policy? I mean, that that has been a large question. I think Donald Trump's going to have to make that case as we go into November. But I can tell you, I think what voters on the Republican side like about him is at least where he's starting from. And that is, he thinks America needs to be strong. Uh, that that America is getting a raw deal in policy engagements, and also that we need to be more aggressive in fighting terrorism. And the specific tactics that he's going to use and strategies, he's going to have to explain and make the case to voters in the coming days. He's going to have to make the case. He hasn't already, though. Not in detail. I think he's He's made more broader policy points about what America should be doing and kind of the, the, the broader mindset. Uh, but no, he hasn't rolled out in-depth policy plans. You're right. We saw that the other day. He started using a teleprompter. I think we're going to see a little bit more in control, uh, more specifics coming out of Donald Trump. But also, look, he, we know that Hillary Clinton in the United States is one of the most unlikable and unpopular politicians of all time. Uh, Donald Trump is unpopular. It's, a, it's, it's relatively new that he's unpopular. And so Trump's going to spend a lot of his time as well of reminding voters why they don't trust Hillary Clinton. All right. Uh, our viewers seem to, uh, in a snap poll uh, that we had, 67 percent said they would vote for Hillary Clinton. They're not all U.S. citizens, of course. Uh, uh, that was on the hashtag F24 uh, debate. Uh, if you look at the electoral map right now, it seems to be playing uh, very much so in Hillary Clinton's favor. We mentioned that CNN poll that uh, says that uh, she has a 13-point lead uh, at this particular point in time, but there are six months to go uh, until uh, Election Day. Uh, Kevin Sheridan, uh, you made it abundantly clear your personal distaste uh, for Mr. Trump. How does the prospect of uh, President Clinton sound to you? Pretty terrible. Uh, no, this is the this is the conundrum. So will you, that ho will you hold your nose and right vote now. for Donald no. Trump? 
Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, at this point, no, but I, I would never vote for Hillary Clinton. I think there's a lot of Republicans like me who are sitting there thinking, I can't vote for either of these two. Uh, you know, between the lesser of two evils, I'm not voting for evil. So, I, I, you know, I don't know what, what that looks like. I don't know if a third party emerges. I doubt it. I, don't, I think it's too late probably for it. But, uh, you know, if he, if he goes and convinces uh, a huge swath of the Republican Party uh, that exists right now, maybe 20 percent, it might get smaller as we go forward. Uh, that he's he can be presidential, that he's uh, you know this was all an act all along, and that he's got the foreign policy chops and and really starts to study policy. Maybe you know I wouldn't rule it out, but I, I haven't seen anything in, in you know in in his uh, in his last six months that, that would show me that he can do that. But we'll see. I, I think I think we call those the five stages of grief. The last being acceptance. Uh, you're probably what at three or four right now. Yeah, yeah. I th I don't know that I'll ever get there. <laughs> you don't know if you'll ever get there. Uh, reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. Either Trump or Clinton would put the world on the edge of Armageddon uh, when it comes to foreign uh, policy. Celia Bellin, are you surprised? Again, here we're, we're, we're hearing this argument take place publicly among Republicans. Is this just normal behavior for Americans or is there something really happening inside of the Republican Party? Uh, there's a civil war inside of the Republican Party. Civil war. Right. It's been going on for years now, and now it's out in the open. It could have been the same with the Ted Cruz nomination, uh, even though it would have been more controlled, because I think uh, Republicans maybe, uh, and I'm not sure about that, Mr. Sheridan would have uh, more easily rallied around uh, Ted Cruz. What's happening is that you've had uh, a Republican Party that was quite unified up until uh, the Bush administration uh, that was bringing social conservative, economic conservative, neoconservative under the same umbrella. And then you had the election of uh, Barack Obama and the beginning, you know, and the, the, the extreme um, disappointment with uh, uh, President Bush at the end of President Bush. And then you had the Tea Party movement, which was an, an inside insurgency, a right wing insurgency that started to uh, shift entirely the power structure of the party. And the party has had to deal with this uh, right-wing insurgency uh, inside, which has, uh, you know, um, led to the fall of Eric Cantor, which was uh, the House Majority Leader, and um, of uh, John Boehner dropping out because he was tired of fighting with the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party. And um, this uh, wing of, um, of the Republican Party has now taken over through Trump is not exactly a Tea Party person, but it's the same type of, you know, we're fed up with DC, we're fed up with the usual people, we want something new. Um, and and the party now has to revolve, resolve this, uh, this difficult uh, uh, situation. And I think this year is going to be particularly instrumental. Sarah Hagmeyer, at the outset of the show, you said vote for Trump, he's an outsider. But once you voted for him, if he does get elected, yeah. how does he then work with a Congress which uh, has proved difficult to work with both for Democratic and Republican presidents? Well, well, Mr. Trump is a businessman, so I think he's going to be pretty orderly about things. But I think at this point, I mean, speaking for the next generation of um, you know politics, we're very hopeless and disappointed with where this, the direction, um, where this election is going. So, what yeah, we and, need and to on do. that point, Sarah, let me ask you because in 2008, sure. Barack Obama wins on a on a slogan of "Yes, we can." This time around, it's it's vitriol, it's uh, uh, negative campaigning all around. Right. Um, no, it's yeah. This time around, it's more, I think, as a country, well, we're going to make America great again. And what we're finding is that, well, as millennials, we're finding common ground with Bernie Sanders supporters. And Bernie Sanders supporters, we don't want to vote for, they don't want to vote for Hillary, and but they'll vote for Trump because we have common ground, because we're anti-corrupt government. We want, you know, the war for the people. So I think with coming together, this will also ignite Congress to come together as well. And we'll be able to get things done because it's finally time for America to come first. That's an interesting point there. Uh, Sarah, Sarah Hagmeyer courting 
uh, supporters uh, of the uh, left-wing candidate uh, Bernie Sanders. Are the traditional fault lines between left and right being redrawn on both sides of the Atlantic? Is she right to make that pitch? Is it going to be a successful one? More than the fault line, it might be even the electoral map. You showed the map where you have solid uh, Democrat and solid Republican and then leaning Democrat, leaning Republican, and only a few uh, battleground at this point. I think it's nine swing states or something like that. The way forward for Trump, if he were to win, would be to redraw the electoral map and maybe to catch some of these states that are currently blue, but that are, um, you know, dominantly uh, white and, and, and poorer Americans and Americans that might have preferred Sanders to Hillary Clinton. I am pretty sure that he will have a good political team pointing out uh, the vulnerabilities of those leaning Democrats or solid Democrat states. And if he were to grab other states, uh, not not only the battlegrounds, but but some others out of uh, Clinton's uh, you know solid uh, base, uh, that would change a little bit. I think he has an up uphill battle. He has the most difficult task in a way, but the campaign has not begun. He can still there are insurgents, corner... but not enough of them. Um, Sorry? There are insurgents in America, but not enough of them? Well, there are plenty of them. And the question will be on one side for the, for the Trump campaign to register, you know, the, the angry uh, uh, right-wing uh, insurgents and for the Democratic campaign to uh, register the angry minority, uh, disenfranchised uh, minorities uh, that uh, are completely opposed uh, um, to Trump discourse. All right. Hillary Clinton, uh, on the campaign trail... Uh, talking about her jobs and manufacturing program in Kentucky a few days ago, made uh, what looked like her first cabinet appointment. Uh, I've told my husband he's got to come out of retirement and be in charge of this because, <laughs> you know, he's got more ideas a minute than anybody I know. You've got to put people back to work and make it, make it happen. Ke Kevin Sheridan, uh, Bill Clinton, remembered... Uh, as a centrist uh, Democrat, is that a smart thing for Hillary Clinton to be saying on the on the campaign trail? Hey, I'm I'm the one who can bring you somebody who's middle of the road. You know, it depends. Bill Clinton's always been kind of a two sides of uh, you know he he could uh, he could help or he could really hurt. You know, he he reminds uh, everyone that he's yeah that she's you know the last generation that this is not like a new and fresh uh, change uh, candidate. Uh, Bill Clinton, though, if he's on his A-game, which he's been far from it for the last probably couple of years, uh, you know, can be a very effective campaigner. He can explain things. He's very good at, you know, uh, touching, you know, the common man and being able to, to campaign. But, you know, the country's largely moved on from that era. And it's, it's not, you know, he's also got NAFTA and he's got all sorts of, uh, he's got all sorts of things that, you know, he signed, he signed DOMA, the uh, Defense of Marriage Act. So, you know, a lot of things that she's now had to distance herself from what came from his administration. And so she's got this weird dynamic where she's got to embrace him in some ways and not in other ways. And don't don't forget, Donald Trump is going to destroy um, Bill Clinton as well. He's going to go right after all of his personal problems. He's going to he's going to make Bill Clinton a big issue in this campaign. Uh, John Thomas, uh, destroying the Clintons is one thing. But how uh, will the candidate Trump in the fall go after those middle of the road independent voters that will swing the election? Sure. Well, one is reminding people that they can't trust Hillary or that, is, as Donald Trump likes to say, she's crooked Hillary. So that's one one approach. And, and the other is what we just you just were talking about. I think Hillary Clinton's Achilles heel is trade. Uh, the NAFTA deal that her husband signed when he was president. Uh, a lot of these independents or and even blue collar Democrats are unemployed. Their jobs have been shipped overseas and they're wondering what why is the U.S. not fighting to keep jobs here? And Donald Trump has a much better jobs argument um, to make than Hillary Clinton to those voters. John Donald Trump also comes with the experience saying, uh, you know, Hillary, how many jobs have you created in your lifetime? I've created thousands. I know what it takes. So I think it's really going to be come down to our old saying we like to have here. It's about the economy, stupid. Celia Bellin. Well, you know, I think Donald Trump is going to try to make this election about character and not policy, because if we're talking policy, well, Hillary Clinton has proven 
She knows more about policy than anybody else. She has more ideas. She has more programs. She's detailed everything, which is one of her problem is that she offers two technocratic solutions to uh, people that want, you know, emotions and gut feelings about things. But in terms of jobs, the, so far... Uh, and this every blowback, but this blowback against free trade, uh, it's on both sides of the Atlantic right now. Yes, there's a, there's a very interesting and potentially uh, damaging uh, argument to be made against uh, Hillary Clinton on, on free trade because of uh, NAFTA and, and the role of uh, Bill Clinton played into it. But she was smart uh, politically to distance herself from the Trans-Pacific Partnership that was um, uh, just signed, uh, saying that it did not correspond to what she wanted and probably given how uh, the uh, transatlantic negotiations are going, she's going to be able to distance herself from that again. But the, the point, the important point is that uh, Donald Trump is criticizing her because he wants, the, you know, the criticism to be focused on her. Everything he has offered so far economic, uh, economically was to say, I'm going to be the, the, the best jobs president that God ever created. And he said that. And this is not a program. This, the, it, 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 there's nothing behind it. He's promising all these you know, super solutions with ac actual no practical way of going there. And, and uh, this uh, um, everyday some outrageous statement can he keep it up for six months he has kept it up kept it up for what nine months now ten months i uh, he, i think he can he can go on it, at some point the media has to realize that they're complicit also in this uh, you know hyper media um, hyper uh, 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 exposition of Donald Trump, where uh, it's he says uh, you know uh, ridiculous policy positions, but then no one ever contradicts him because he also says outrageous statements. Uh, at the White House correspondent dinner, uh, um, Barack Obama pointed out the responsibility of the news media in uh, this uh, situation, and uh, I'm not sure how much of that is going to change because you know everybody is excited to talk about Trump, and that's how. How he, he earns points. All right, guilty as charged uh, with today's discussion. Uh, Sylvia Benin, I want to thank you. I want to thank uh, Sarah Hagmar for joining us from Tabernacle, New Jersey, uh, John Thomas in Los Angeles, and uh, Kevin Sheridan in Washington. Stay with us. Our Media Watch segment is next. Enter uh, James Creedon. Hi, Francois. Was it difficult uh, finding talk about Donald Trump on social media? I think this segment usually lasts about four or five minutes. I could probably go on for about four or five hours pretty <laughs> easily this evening. Uh, it was a pretty easy one uh, to, to get material on, Francois. Um, we'll start with the front cover of uh, the front page of the New York Daily News today. Uh, GOP reimagined as... Grand old funeral. Oh, Dearly dear. beloved, we are gathered here today to mourn the GOP, a once great political party killed by epidemic of Trump. There you go. Uh, you, were t you showed that tweet earlier uh, by Lindsey Graham, Francois, and indeed a lot of tenors in the uh, Republican Party have been tweeting at that, you know, uh, where are they going to go now? This, this is uh, particularly... Uh, the orange menace, oh that's dear. That's right. Pigs may <laughs> fly, hell may freeze over, and a lifelong GOPer will never unite behind the orange menace. Never Trump. Now, never Trump, that hashtag uh, has been used uh, quite a bit by people uh, on uh, the, the, the GOP piece out of the divide. But after, uh, well, first of all, you, you are after Ted Cruz pulled out, which essentially handed the nomination to Donald Trump, you saw some uh, Republican Party members burning their uh, membership cards. And uh, that wasn't an isolated incident. There were lots of images like that. Uh, you see their adios uh, being put up by uh, Therese of Arc and uh, various other uh, images like that being put up on social media. Never Trump then became never ever Trump. <laughs> And somebody thought thought it apt to add another never again. And then to finish it with a prayer, Francois, Lord, please give us an alternative uh, to the top in each party. Uh, Sylvia Benin, did that Republican strategist, John Thomas, was there a grain of truth in what he said about how the, the others, they're going through denial, but once it's over, they'll... 
Yes, I'm afraid so. A part of it, it's going to be it's going to be divided. Some people will join Hillary Clinton. Some people will say neither nor, the, never ever uh, the candidates. But some of them, you know, they're going to go for the jobs. They're going to go for the big positions. They'll be tempted. Right. So never Trump became never ever Trump, and some of those never ever Trumps converted into. I'm with her. Now, that's not something you expect to hear from a, a, a GOP member. And you can see there that Hillary uh, is interpreted. And we saw that with a former aide to, uh, to John McCain. That's right, amongst others. And indeed, uh, so it wasn't just Hillary fans who were tweeting, I'm with her. This is the only person between at the, the real Donald Trump and the Oval Office. What else do we have just very quickly? Uh, gay Patriot is no longer at GOP. So he waited until this evening to figure that one out. And you had this tweet. This is um, from those who were, I suppose, against Ted Cruz's position on Comedian abortion. Comedian Samantha B. That's right. Uh, shouldn't Ted Cruz have been forced to carry his own viable campaign to term? Anyway, that got that got shared quite a bit. A, a, a bit of a bit of humour there. Uh, the Bernie fans uh, reminding uh, those uh, who are you know that of course he did win Indiana, and it, this isn't from their point of view st a choice between Hillary and uh, and Donald Trump. That there is still another factor uh, in the equation, and uh, some people sharing as well the fact that he actually in most polls. Trump's Trump, uh, and that's a uh, that's Gosh, uh, more than more than Clinton. That's right. So uh, that's something that isn't getting enough exposure, according to uh, some of the pollsters. They're saying really, uh, that's a, a pretty interesting. Uh, statistic. All right. Six more months of fodder, says Celia Benham. Many thanks for that, <laughs> uh, James Creed. And thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.